The Ballpark Digest broadcaster chat begins now. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler. Nick Gillespie will be joining me. Uh, We're going to be talking about opening day in minor league baseball. It's the big thing this week. I'm coming on the road. I'm the voice of the Lansing Lugnuts. Nick Gillespie, the voice of the Tennessee Smokies, AA, Chicago Cubs. There are some things to discuss as we, each of us, get our seasons open. 2019, getting everything going. So let's bring Nick Gillespie in. Let's start talking about some minor league baseball opening day from the start of the season. We open up this show, uh, we were in the preseason. We were getting everything prepared for the upcoming baseball season. And there was spring training. But Mick, now we have a regular season to talk about. Happy start to the minor league baseball season. Yeah, really. Uh, we had a game to count it last night. And so that was a lot of fun. And, I mean, look, you're in your hotel room. Why didn't you make the bed, though, Jesse? Or you just you just roll out of bed and do the show? <laughs> you know how I roll. Hey, it's great to be back yeah. doing baseball again. Yeah, definitely. Hey, look, I'm, I'm out uh, on campus at the University of Tennessee um, you know, trying to fit everything in that we need to, which includes uh, exercise for me on a, what's turned out to be a beautiful day. So a very memorable opening day last night because in all my time with the Smokies, this is where we actually had um, opening day at our home stadium. Why? That's amazing. Well, it's because the team, so it's the northernmost team. In the, in the league. So, um, you know, they normally schedule it where we're on the road. But this year it was at home and the weather's, you know, cooperated. We had a great night and there was some rain earlier today, but that's blown out. So, uh, you know, perfect. It seems to me that if you don't want to host games there in April, Midwest League teams would love to rent it out and will play games in Tennessee in April instead of in Wisconsin or in Michigan. Yeah, that's it. And it's funny. I mean, like you think about your league or even the big leagues, you know, the White Sox tried to have their opener. Uh, They'll do it today. Didn't work out with the weather. Uh, You know, the Cubs are going to be coming back home, although they're starting on the road this year. Uh, They still have a series in Milwaukee before they get back to Wrigley. And here we are in Tennessee in the South. And, you know, we're the northernmost team in the Southern League. And, you know, for all these years, we've started on the road until now. And, but, you know, I mean, I guess if you have that advantage and you can do it, you might as well, but there's just something special about playing a game in your home stadium to start the year. Yeah. For you, how many opening days has this been? Oh, man. Well, 12 for the Smokies. So uh, the the first 11 were in Mississippi, the team we played last night. Jacksonville, we've done one there. Pensacola, I think like two or three there. Uh, Chattanooga, we've had some there, which isn't far from where we're at. And then, you know, of course, this year – you know, at home, but um, I, I kept going through in my mind. I was like, I thought, well, maybe once before, but then when I, I looked through the media guide, I was like, no, I mean, and even before I got there. So it's been a long time since the Smokies actually opened up at home. From my, uh, to me, and just in talking to people around minor league baseball, right? Opening day is thrilling, but it's also, how do we get all of the work that we need to get done, done in time for the season to start? Everything that goes into making sure that everything is ready and then the season gets underway, and you just fast forward a week, and now we're all in rhythm. But that rhythm hasn't set in yet. No. I mean, you know, last night, and for me it was, wasn't too bad because I'd done, uh, you know, like 23 games in spring training. So, I mean, I was in kind of a, you know, I honestly felt fine last night. You know, for Spencer, my partner, you know, throw the broadcast over to him in the third, and I'm thinking, you know, this dude's probably like – Ah, new team, you know, new, haven't done a game in a long time, but he sounded fine, and we had, a, we had a really fun night. And the game was good. I mean, even though there were a lot of errors and it was sloppy, uh, it was still exciting. You know, lead changes and, and big hits and good at bats. Um, the pitching for both sides was, was rusty and not crisp, but still, I, it was a fun night. And, you know, the, to, to win the game, you know, the, even at this level, you, you know, anytime you can go and win – uh, a game that counts, you know, it, it's, it's great. And the crowd was good last night. I don't trust the baseball in early April. I, it seems to me that the players need to get ready and get acclimated, especially in the Midwest League, when last night in Fort Wayne, Indiana, it's about a 29-degree wind chill, 
and it's windy and it's cold and it's raining. And I'm thinking, we're going to see better hitting and better fielding from these guys June, July, and August. But as you say, the energy that baseball is back, it is pouring rain and the wind is gusting. And that combination is just brutal. And there are the fans sitting there, raincoats, umbrellas, because they were ready to see a baseball game again. Yeah, well, it was for us, it was dry. But I agree with you. It's, it's hard to tell in, in April what your team's really going to look like in the minors uh, particularly. I mean, first off, you got, you know, guys who have come up from lower levels that are going to be a little overwhelmed uh, at the, the double-A level, right? Then, then the guys that are good that start the year with your team, sometimes it's just a roster issue, but you lose your best players early because your best players normally are your most experienced players. So they're, they're not going to be there long. And if anyone is in the bullpen pitching and they're good, they're not going to be around long. I mean, look at what's going on with the Cubs right now. They would love to have some of the pitchers that they have in the minor leagues on that big league roster, you know, and I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's going to happen soon where you're going to see Dylan Maples or Alan Webster uh, or Dakota Meccas. Those three to me are right on the verge of being in the big leagues because there's only going to be so many walks and, and so many implosions before Theo Epstein says, you know what, we're going to give these guys that can throw strikes a chance. So, um, you know, that's the way, that's the way that the, that the world of baseball works, you know, and, and it starts, for us here in Double A, it starts right here because you know that like a guy can shoot up from here to the big leagues that fast. In the Blue Jays organization, here's what we've had to deal with: first Triple A, so Buffalo, on the eve of minor league season, or really it was the eve on the major league season, I believe. The Blue Jays traded Kendris Morales. So the Buffalo Bisons are thinking Rowdy Telez is going to be their starting yeah. first baseman. No, now he's needed in Toronto. And then they trade Kevin Pillar, and there goes another outfielder in Buffalo, Anthony Offord. And then Clayton Richards lands on the DL, and there goes the Buffalo starting pitcher and Sean Reed Foley. But then the Blue Jays, with their trades, they pick up Socrates Brito, they pick up Alan Hansen in that Kevin Pillar deal, and now guess what? Anthony back down to the line. Back down to the line. So out of nowhere, a double-A outfielder is traded. The other broadcasters in the system. We couldn't remember the last time we had so many roster transactions before any of us had even played a game before. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it, like, a, like an array of things happening. And, and if your organization's where the Blue Jays are right now, where you're building, it makes it better for yes. us in the minor leagues. You're going to have better players, right? When, when the Cubs were building, it was amazing – the amount of talent that I saw. And I, I've seen good teams, trust me. I mean, like the Smokies, even before uh, Theo and, and those guys took over, uh, they were good. But when, you know, when you start seeing Chris Bryan and Javi Baez and, you know, and, and, and those type of guys come through, Kyle Schwarber, Ian Happ was great in double A. Um, you know, you're, you're looking at the big league team, they're losing 100 games, you know, but your, your team, even if you don't make the playoffs or you're getting close, you're just enjoying the fact that the, the talent that you are looking at every day um, is elite, right? And that's maybe where you guys are going to be. I've seen Socrates Burrito. He's a, he's a good player. He was uh, in Mobile in the Southern League. And then I've seen him in uh, spring training some. Uh, but when your team's good, like the Cubs are right now, or they're supposed to be good, then all of a sudden, you know, Glaber Torres doesn't get there because he gets traded. Eloy Jimenez gets traded before you get him. Uh, Dylan Cease gets traded, and, and that you make, need to make those moves to keep your team competitive at the big league level. But the problem is us, and then all of a sudden we've got all these holes where we've had, <laughs> you know, where you were expecting to have these star players and you're not getting them. Let me ask you about this. <laughs> Travis Bergen was a pitcher for the Lansing Lugnuts, or was he? I want to know where you come down on. He gets sent to Lansing, opening day roster. This is a couple of years ago. Left-hander scheduled to be in our bullpen in throwing his side session the day before opening day feels a twinge in the elbow that's it he's done he's on the shelf he gets sent right back down to florida fast forward these years later he's now a rule five draftee and he's made his major league debut this year would you consider him a lansing lugnut alum or not 
Yeah, good question. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess he was, right? I mean, technically, but he didn't play in any games. So uh, I, I, I'm going to say I'm going to say no. That's my feeling. What, yeah. what, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, but we, but we take guys, Ben Zobrist, Kerry Wood, you know, some great Cubs have come through and just done rehabs with the Smokies. Jake Arrieta. Well, Jake Arrieta actually played a, quite a few games for Tennessee and was in the starting rotation when he got traded from Baltimore and then, you know, was kind of before he was a Cy Young award winner or a great pitcher. I felt like even though he was on a rehab, he was yeah. part of the roster. But Ben Zobrist played like a game or two, you know. But we still consider them alumni. I mean, you go in the clubhouse and there's – you know, a Ben Zobris Smokies card that's painted on the clubhouse wall. Josh is on the roster for Visalia at the time, the A advanced affiliate in Tampa Bay. Now, the double A affiliate is Montgomery, and it still is the Montgomery Biscuits. So he goes first from spring training, the complex in Florida, packs his bag, flies to California gets off the plane they've changed their mind he is now going to double a and he's got to get right back on a plane and now fly to montgomery back to back plane flights he was the tired guy that i've ever seen approaching opening day yeah how about that yeah it's and in this world of baseball i mean you can never really put your stuff down and relax nope. right Opening day, we got a couple more stories for you about weather. You're talking about how Tennessee would never host opening days because you'd rather play somewhere southern or uh, more south. That way you get better weather. So in Michigan, Lansing, Michigan, the year before I came to the Lansing Lugnuts, 2008, they put the tarp down to protect the field in advance of opening day. They're about to host the series. Nick, the tarp froze to the field and they couldn't take it back off again. They had to cancel the game. <laughs> I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that. Now, that's crazy. I, I, I saw, and you guys can check this out if you want to, something called Tarp Nami. Uh, it's a video on YouTube where our tarp was just, sh you know, shredded and thrashed by one of the uh, crazy storms we have in the south. But I've never heard of the tarp <laughs> freezing to the field. I mean, like, I guess like, it, that's just it, right? I mean, like, you go down there, and it's, it's, it's as stiff what as a board. Uh, that's hilarious. Nothing. I mean, like, it just – the players are happy, though. Don't, don't, don't get in. And there's not one player that's in either one of those clubhouses that's gone. You know what, guys? I really want to play this game today. Everybody's like, hey, I think the tarps froze to the field, and they're high-fiving each other. There's some guys who the day before, <laughs> they threw a bucket of water on the field and hoped that it would have freezing conditions. Plan succeeded. Yeah. That's, a, that's so funny. You know, all the things you see in baseball. There was a, a game that the Smokies were going to play a day game, and the, uh, for some reason the grounds crew uh, had the sprinklers come on that morning, and, and it rained the game out. We couldn't play. Like they, and, and I don't know if, like, a sprinkler head broke and, you know, whatever, but I just remember Buddy Bailey was the manager, which you'll meet in your, in your league. You'll be with South Bend. And Buddy did this thing, like, it used to drive the groundskeepers crazy. He he would walk around on the field and, and with his feet and just keep <laughs> doing this, you know. And, and when, when when you know when you spend your entire life to get these fields ready, to have the manager out there like he's the grounds crew guy, you know, touching the field and stuff, you could you could see the tension, you know. And he would do that. He he'll probably do that if it rains in your game. You know, he's just looking out for the. Safety of the players, you know, he's just trying to make sure that the field's okay. But, you know, he went, some reason the sprinklers came on, you're digging the field up trying to fix it, and then here comes the manager out, like, pawing around. I mean, oh, my goodness. And, and, it, and it was a sellout that day, too. So it was a day game, and it was a sellout. We had all, you know, all these people in the stadium and uh, couldn't play. Oh, my goodness. That, that's a tough one right uh, there. Let me tell you about a sellout where we couldn't play on a 50-degree day. But before that about drying a field out. Have you ever seen a team bring a helicopter out to use the blades? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, it wasn't in, uh, in, um, it wasn't in pro ball. It was in college. 
when uh, for a couple seasons I was part of Alabama's broadcast crew, and we were at Mississippi State, and they 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 burnt some of the water off the field, like off the infield, like where basically you put gasoline on it and light it, and it, it takes care of it. And then they brought a helicopter in, and and um, we still played in you know that much water. And I remember thinking like this would have never flown in pro ball because. You know, like they, there, you just wouldn't do it, right? But in college baseball, you know, it's up to the coaches, and you know, and you go out there and play. And and the crazy thing is, growing up, we yeah. played in that. You no, know, we, we, if the game, it didn't matter. I mean, I, if the infield dirt was was usable, we wanted to play. So there was water on the grass and a lot of it, but the infield dirt was good enough to do. And um, yeah, so they did all those things to get the field ready. And then I tell people, I'm like, hey, they actually poured gasoline on the water. And, and it burnt up. Amazing. Uh, the dirt was a little singed. <laughs> I yeah. talk about how Buddy and uh, the groundskeeper, how protective groundskeepers are of their field. Well, in college baseball, the players and the coaching staff basically serve as grounds crew. They've got to help take care of the field. They've got to pull tarp. They've got to rake it. They've got to do whatever needs to happen. Yeah, you know, it was great. Um, I was listening to an interview on the score yesterday, and Jason Benetti was on there as the guest. He's the White Sox television broadcaster. And he was telling stories about, you know, because it was minor league opening day, about being in the minor leagues. And he told a story about at the Hotel Salem Avalanche. And it was for Salem Red Sox for him. Uh, but he also said something else that I thought was cool. He, he, he said, you know, the, the, the minor league broadcaster, we do so many things besides broadcasting. And it's really hard to hone the craft when you're worried about game notes and stat packs and, you know, lining up interviews and pulling tarp, which is something that I had to do exactly. for years before uh, I got to Tennessee, you know. So you do all these other things. And he says, hey, you don't want minor league GM? Give these guys, uh, these broadcasters, a chance to work on the craft. It'd be good for the game. And I thought that was a, that was a great point to make. When I was with the Windy City Thunderbolts, our head groundskeeper was our director of group sales and also our PA announcer. So he was the voice of the ballpark. He would disappear during innings to go check on his groups to see how the groups were doing. He'd run back upstairs to announce the next batter, and then suddenly it would start to rain, and he'd be running back downstairs to man the tarp pole. Oh, yeah. Alex Cohen's our uh, Iowa broadcaster, AAA with the Cubs. He's a great guy. And when he was in Huntsville, he was, he was kind of an interred broadcaster, you know, like when he first started broadcasting. And we were there to play. And they got on the PA and told him, like, he was right on the air. We need to, you know, get down here to pull the tarp. And he, you know, I guess he took a break. The commercial, hey, we'll be right back. And boom, right down he went. He didn't put his headset in your broadcast booth. <laughs> and pull the tarp. No, I mean, I don't know. I didn't know. I was just kind of like, oh, my goodness. Like, you know, but that, that some of those teams, uh, you know, they're so broke. And they have just, you know, they just don't have the, the resources to really do it right. And so... They're just absolutely abusing the people that they have. And unfair to him, you know, that he would have to do that. Um, but, you know, I, we, we did a game together in spring training, and I was just thinking, like, how proud I am of him. For, he said, how many guys would have quit? You know, how many people would have been like, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, they're, they're going to call me down, and, you know, I put all this time and effort into this place. I'm not getting paid, you know, all, everything that goes into it to be on the air for those two or three hours and make the most out of those two or three hours, right? And then you're on the air and, and you know, you've got somebody coming over the PA and calling you down. Now, the perspective that the front office has is, well, you know what? We can't pull the tarp without him. Exactly. <laughs> so he's got to get down here because, you know, you need at least five people to pull that tarp. All right. So here's my story about how we had 50 some, maybe even 60 degrees clear skies and we had to cancel the entire opening series do you know do you know what permafrost is
No. Permafrost is, and I'm reading right from Wikipedia, so you can criticize me, quote unquote, it's ground including rock or soil at or below the freezing point of water for two or more years. So there it is with the soil, and it's that layer right below it. And it's been frozen for several years at minimum. So here we go. We're about to start up things on opening day. And the weather is warm enough with the sun beating down that the permafrost unfreezes. And it all melted right below our infield. And our infield, which looked in great shape and was ready to go, within the span of 30 minutes, turned into swampland. No. There was really? nothing they could do. We did everything we could to try to rescue that field for the opening series. And we had to wipe out each game with the most gorgeous weather in the air. So there we are. This is, this is a year where, now me personally, I'm sick as a dog. Because I don't know about you, but when the players come up from spring training, uh, some guys bring diseases, and sometimes it catches. So the players arrive. It was good to meet everyone. Somebody gave me something, and I was done. And so that four games, secretly I'm thinking, I could use this because I was not in position to go anywhere. But permafrost crushed us that year. And then not too long after that, permafrost crushed the Great Lakes loons in our same league. The permafrost under the soil melting, unfreezing, and there goes your infield. I've never heard of that before. But it's crazy. I mean, you learn so much when you've been around this game for a long time about grass and fields. Last year, the Smokies had a field that was just a disaster. You know, and then we went out and got the best grounds crew guy you can get, and now the field looks great, you know. And those guys, when you, you ask them, it's like, hey, here's why we had an issue. Here's what went wrong, or here's why, you know, here's how you grow grass, or here's how you do the infield, you know. And it's like, um, I, but I've never heard that before. But I believe it. I mean, I, I mean, like, and I could see me being there, every, everyone ready to go. And then all of a sudden, like, the, instead of the water falling, you know, coming from the sky, it, it's coming from exactly. underneath. Crazy. We had a couple of years ago, grass fungus. At first, whatever was a grass disease uh, afflicted one field in the league and the players with their spikes would all stop all over it. They'd go around it and the spikes were not adequately cleaned and they tracked it to every stadium that they went into. And suddenly we had a grass epidemic. No way. Wow. That yes. is nuts. And I bet, who, who started it? Did they, did yeah, they know we, where we it came from? Patient zero. Who was it? It doesn't matter now, does it? Oh, you don't want to say it. it. Was I guess it was not Lansing. Hey, but look. It, it was one of those yeah, things right. where you just hey, know. I know the hey, groundskeepers. All players, all teams yeah. out there, clean your spikes. Clean the spikes. Yeah, really. Golly, that would be terrible. And those groundskeepers, they work so hard on those fields. I can't even imagine their feeling to have their grass just destroyed because of the players' cleats, you know? And who would think, like, grass, like, has funguses and, you know? My, my grandfather was a keeper. And, um, you know, he, there, bees get illnesses and stuff, you know? And I remember him telling me that. Make your audio. Make your audio. Make your audio real quick. Check your audio. Now we're on reverb. We'll check back and see if we can get things back up. Let's try it again. Thank you. It's funny to think where we can go in these conversations, going back and forth, where things can lead us, just in talking baseball. We've got the minor league season back. If you go to ballparkdigest.com, you can check this out. Minor league baseball opening day. They've also been uh, previewing every single stadium in the major leagues, Fenway Park. What's new there? And at every single ballpark in the majors, what's going on? Let's get Mick back in. Uh, meanwhile, earlier today, Kevin Reichardt, the publisher of Ballpark Digest, did a live chat. Fayetteville, Vegas, new, renovated Delmarva, Pulaski, El Paso, Fresno. Check out that video. We've got Mick back. Mick, it's funny. And you and I were talking about this just going in, how... We'll just talk, and you never know where we'll go to. I've got another story for you real quick. Have you ever seen grass get burned by the sun? Yes. When you put the tarp on, if you put the tarp on, right, and the sun's hot, you'll, you'll burn it. And I've seen teams do that 
and I, I've, I've watched before. I mean, look, I'm a wise old owl at this point. You know, I'm up in my perch, and I look down, and I'll see, like, the, it, maybe the, 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 it was going to rain, and they put the tarp out, and then here's the sun. You don't have much time. You better get that tarp off the field if it's really hot and humid because that grass will burn up. And I've seen teams do that, and then you'll have, like, you know, yellow grass around the infield. Totally scorched earth. Basically looks like it. You're done. That's it. Yep. Yep. And, and, and to me, that's unexcusable. You know, you, you, you've got a groundskeeper there. You know, their job is to make sure that, that someone's watching to make sure that if that sun comes out, you've got to get the tarp off the field. Oh, yeah. Let's talk baseball lingo. And let me put okay. this right in your court. You're back on the air yesterday. You're calling your first yep. regular season ball game since last year. Was there any slang, any term that you used that's a favorite of yours that was good to drop into the broadcast again? Uh, well, um, you mean terms that I use or terms that we all use? I'm saying you personally. Me personally, okay. I use uh, this term scratch gravel. I don't even know why I use it. It's like if you get your glove down in the dirt to scoop up a ball, and it can only be in the infield, you know, like it's got to be a really hot, like smash down by your cleats. You know, you scratch gravel, you got to dig that thing up and boom, throw it to first. And that's like a, a phrase when you're teaching kids how to play, like you got to get your glove down, you know, because you see so many kids that don't get their glove all the way down to feel the ball and it'll go right under your glove. You know, if you're down, you bring it up, you can still block it. Right. But if you don't go down far enough, it could, it could go right through you. So I use that term. Um, and uh, I, I work that in. The other one that I use, and people probably think it's like an old baseball term in general, is uh, if a ball is right down the middle of the plate, I say down the old jotty. And people think, like, maybe I'm thinking, like, old, what is old jotty? You know, like, is that like a, you know, like a, someone, one of the players years ago said, is that, I always thought you said old Johnny, like a toilet. And I said, no, the old jotty is a bridge that's right behind the ballpark at AT&T Field in Chattanooga, the old Jotty Bridge. And so when I was doing games for the lookouts, I just, instead of saying down Main Street, I'd say down the old Jotty, you know, like if the ball was hit to left field and into the street, it would be hit onto the old Jotty and you'd see the ball bouncing down the bridge. And so I just keep using it. I mean, I, that's just my term. How about you? On that same subject, so I always grew up hearing right down Broadway for a pitch right down the middle. And so I brought that into Lansing, right down Broadway, called the strike. And the listener said, we don't have Broadway here. No. But we do have Michigan Avenue that the stadium is on. Why don't you say that instead? And so yeah. I thought, that's absolutely what I should say. Here's the pitch right down Michigan Avenue, strike one call. Yeah. And, you know, Michigan Avenue works, too, because it, you know, in Chicago, Michigan has such a big deal, too. So, I mean, people get the idea of, of what it is. But the, you know what? It's like when you call a game, you know, what's great about being on the air is that you call it the way you want to call it. And people get the gist of what you're saying, right? Um, I mean, like, I, I want to do things different. I just do. Like, you know, and, and some things you have to do the same. I mean, look, it, it always goes back to the fundamentals, I say. But at the same time, like, I appreciate – when someone can be an individual on the air. That took me time to learn because I'm growing up, I'm listening to the broadcasts and the way that the broadcasters would call the game got so ingrained into me that when I first got on the air and started calling games, I would use the same words that I had heard. So for example, top of the fifth inning, ground ball down to third base, those across, got them at first base and that ends the inning. I yeah. To myself, but it ended the top of the fifth. Right. It did end the whole fifth inning. I don't feel real comfortable saying that ends the inning or anything where I, where I would say it. And then I'd think about what I was saying and I'd say to myself, that actually didn't sound right coming out of my mouth. It sounded great coming out of his mouth. Right. But for me, that just did not feel comfortable. That's not how I would say something. Right. Well, I mean, 
I, my whole life, I've thought of half innings when you're batting. That's your inning at the plate. So I, I, yes. I get that one. But I know what you mean, though, because there's times where you do say things when it's like, well, it's technically not the end of the inning, but it's the end of your inning at the plate. One other term that I got to bring up. Yes. One of my signatures, <clears throat> and I've been doing it since I started broadcasting, is when you go to the, uh, you leave the seventh and go to the eighth, you go to the business end of the game, the mm -hmm. eighth and the ninth. And I, I came up with that really because my first ever color commentator when I was in the Coastal Plain League with Wilson years ago, uh, his coach used to say that at Barton College, that, you know, like, hey, we're going into the business end, guys. You know, when you get to the eighth and the ninth, it's when the business is done, you know. And I say that, and it's funny because um, people will, you know, will tweet, at me in certain games and you know and be like business end you know and it's 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 cool that it's kind of picked up and I, I feel like if uh if i ever get an opportunity to do it at the big league level all the time i think that people would really appreciate that because it, it really is the business end of the game you know and and i mean like so many games are one loss last night the smokies won and it was because they won the business end i, I like that i Use it. I use, use it. Just give I me credit. some phrases that are totally tributes to other broadcasters. So I would absolutely use that in tribute to you. I say half. Put it in your next book. Every, yeah, fourth well, edition. Fourth. Put it in Look, there. I'm, I'm writing these down right now for a reason, sir. Yeah, yeah. Put me in there. That's three. I gave you three. <laughs> yes, you did. Dave Raymond was the broadcaster I worked with in Brockton, Massachusetts. Middle of the fifth, he would always say halfway to the house. And so after that, anytime oh, we get a good to the one. middle of the fifth. I always think halfway to the house or halfway yeah. home. Yeah, that's cool. I like that one. We had a sponsor deal where when the three, four, five batters were coming up, you had to say the sponsor, meat of the order, whichever kind of meat manufacturer it yeah. was. Whoever did the meat, this was their meat of the order. And so ever yeah. since then, if I see the three, four, five batters coming up, I just naturally have to say it's the meat of the order. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah, meat of the order, uh, you know, the heart of the lineup. I mean, there's so many different ways to hit that that middle three. When you're when you're broadcasting good teams, you know, like spring training, you get to some of those lineups that Joe Madden has, and it's you know Chris Bryant, Anthony Rizzo, Javi Baez, Kyle Schwarber in that mix. You know, it's fun. You know, you look at the meat, and there's really meat there. You got a bad team. You look at the meat, and you're like, "Well, I get past the fourth guy, and like, <laughs> we got a we got a slap hitter fifth. We got a guy yeah. that strikes out six. We're not gonna, we're not going to do anything here." I've had teams where whether it was the three, four, five, or the six, seven, eight, it didn't really matter. You didn't know who the rally was going to come from. You just hoped that there was a rally at some point. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Got another one uh, for you. Uh, Another phrase that for me, uh, I used it and then I realized I was using it wrong after hearing other guys use it right but not understanding what it meant. Cliche, it's a whole new ball game or it's a brand new game. That kind oh, of thing. yeah, Pretty yeah. Cool. So I'm guessing like it's a, a, a new ball game is when it's you were behind and or they were behind and the game's tied, right? Isn't that what that, that means? That is exactly what it means. It's three to nothing. Oh, we've tied it up. It's a brand new game. Yeah. Right. Six to two going in, six to six is the brand new game. So oh, I'm thinking, yeah. here we go. We come back from a massive deficit <laughs> and we take the lead. And so in my heart, I'm like, oh, came back. It's a brand new game. And then they went ahead. And I, but I said it's a brand new game after one team came back and took the lead back. So it came back oh, yeah. six to two, tied at six to six. Then the other team came back and made it seven to six. And I literally said on the air, paraphrasing from memory, it's a brand new game. And then it's the old game again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you say things, believe it or not. And then you go back and go, why did I say that? You know, it just came out. Like, I didn't even mean, I know better than that. Like, I didn't, I, I know that's wrong, but it just comes right. out and, I don't know. Like I had a guy tell me one time that if you make a mistake, you keep going because 25% of the people know you made a mistake. 75% don't even notice. But when you go back and fix it, you correct that mistake. 
then 100% of the people you know you messed up. The 25% that knew that you messed up in the first place, and then the other 75% that just heard you say, oh, well, you know, I messed that up. You know? So if you go back and correct yourself, make it at, at a point where you really have to. Like, <laughs> otherwise, just keep on trucking. Our call of the week, and we tried to do this last week, and then my internet went on the fritz. Uh, it was for the specific purpose of I take great heart in great broadcasters making mistakes. It was Chuck Thompson making this, the mistake of the wrong pitcher on Bill Mazeroski's home run, winning the yeah. 1960 World Series. It was Ralph. My guy, too, by the way. My mentor. Well, Thanks, Jesse. You and me both, but Mark <laughs> Dittmar throws. It was Ralph Terry who threw it, not Dittmar. And then at the end of the game, he's summing it up. He's about to throw to, we're going to do interviews, we're going to do all of this. And he gave the final scores, the Pirates winning 10 to nothing. And that made me feel so good. And it, just like any time I hear a major league broadcaster, that brief stumbler, that brief correction of self, that makes me go, this person that I'm listening to right now is human. And yeah, that kind well, of we all humanity, are. That endears me so much to them. I worked with Larry Ward, broadcaster of the Lookouts. He's been there forever. I'm guessing like 30 years. And Larry used to say this all, to me all the time. He'd say, who has the perfect broadcast, Mick? And then I'd say, uh, I don't know, Vince Gully. He'd say, no, no one has a perfect broadcast. It's impossible. And the point is, like, look, if you, you make a mistake, you, you know, you, you can't get mad. I, I, I remember a, a young broadcaster in the, um, in the Southern League that uh, is in the majors now. And you know, he's a great guy. I, and I'm in, the, in his, you know, in, in their stadium. I look over, he made a mistake, and he's slamming his headsets and banging his hands. And I'm like, hey, man, no one has a perfect broadcast. Just have fun and let it come to you. It'll be fine. You know, and, like, you know, just relax. I mean, like, and it was kind of coming off of the same thing that, you know, that Larry's point was, is that no one's perfect. And if you listen long enough, um, I, I work games with Ron Coomer, during spring training occasionally. And I love working with him because he's so good uh, as an analyst and, and he's a great guy. And when you make a mistake, he's, a, you know, like you just write it on a piece of paper and slide it over to your partner, you know, instead of correcting him on the air and, and kind of giving him a heads up. So, you know, hey, the Marlins lead the Cubs five to one and oh, oops, we're playing the Mariners, you know, so it's <laughs> Mariners like, oh, and the Mariners, you know, and you just go back and just quickly re-give the score uh, you know, and, and, and go on. But um, let's hear this call. So what do we got this week? Forget, forget the call in terms of the speaker system and everything that was all set up. Nothing set up today. You're just no, no, going to have no call to, today. Okay. No, no call today that we're going to listen to. Um, okay. But on that topic of making mistakes, I think that's why it's so important for us as broadcasters to have that relationship with our listeners because they trust us, we trust them. They understand we're gonna do our best to deliver what's going on and it goes vice versa. There was a game uh, I was calling where a play happened in the sixth inning and my tongue got twisted and everything fell apart all at once. And then I just moved on from there. And after the game, I'm getting on the team bus and the motor coach operator stopped me. He goes, that was a good win today, great call. And he gives a little pause, and he looks at me and goes, what happened in that sixth inning? Yeah. Yeah, Len, Len Casper had one. He, I guess he had done some kind of, like, broadcasting seminar w that uh, Charlie Steiner puts on, and John Miller was there. And they played, like, John Miller messing up, and, you know, it was, like, at the seminar. And it was, like, a mess up, but then he turned it in. It was like, you know, he calls a home run, and he's with the Giants, and he – names the guy who's on deck as the guy that hit the ball. So then, like, like, just going right through it, he says, and he's happy for so-and-so who hit the home run. Who's jogging, you know, and it's like sometimes, you, and if you're listening at home, like 25% are going, hey, wait a second, that's not right. And then 75% are like, oh, that's great. The guy on deck's really cheering for the, for the guy that hit the home run. Uh, they don't get any better than John. I, 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 we've talked about it before. We both love him and think he's the best. And it, and, and it's funny. I mean, if, if he's going to make mistakes and, you know, and, and, and all these guys are going to make mistakes, we're going to definitely make mistakes. I think it's just funny to, um, you know, kind of engage yourself when – some of them are so bad you just have to laugh at yourself. You know, sometimes I just mess up and I'm just like, 
I just start chuckling and, and move on. I think the people that are listening get it. You know, it's like you, you want it to be smooth, but I don't want to sound like a robot. I'm not a robot. You know, I got a personality. Uh, I know the game. I can tell you who what's going on as, as, as well as anyone that's doing it. Um, you know, I'm not a TV anchor man. You know, I'm not a, you know, like I'm not reading a story out of a book. You know, it's impromptu and, I, and I'm doing my best to to kind of hit. And this is the way that my style works is that, you know, I'm doing the game, which is the most important thing. Right. But I'm also yeah. trying to tell the player's story. I'm trying to tell trying to cover current news in sports, you know, and, and I want to do like four, three things, four things at the same time, you know, like where I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, you know. That's difficult to do. That's what's hard, and, and it's it's hard to do it and, and not have a flub every once in a while. One of my favorite flubs from a major league broadcaster, and it provoked the best holy cow from Phil Rizzuto. Yankees broadcast team is calling a game, and they've got the pitcher out on the mound spinning a gem, and the information was finally relayed to them in the sixth inning. By the way, it's a different starter than you think that it is. <laughs> How about that? Holy cow. Yeah. Wouldn't that be something? Uh, look, it, it can happen, too. You know, if, if, if you don't know the other team um, and, and you know, that's what the paper in front of you says, you, you just do it. You know, you, you got it written in that way. And, and you know, sometimes it just goes by. You're thinking of a thousand different things as you're broadcasting every single night. You know, and, it, and it's like people – will try to add different jobs on to what I'm doing when I'm calling a game. And you, the more of that stuff that you put on the plate for me, the more mistakes I'm going to make. Oh yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you got, like you add, you want to add like, you know, f you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 reads. You got to get into those and sponsor reads and all that stuff. Th those are difficult when you're not, when you don't have a producer handing you, Hey, you know, here's, here's the read here. Um, you know, when I'm doing SEC Network games, I like to have those ahead of time because I want to read through them and, and, and have an idea of what I'm going to say. But if it's like spur of the moment stuff, you know, it's, it's hard to do that and then stay focused on everything else that you're working on. Not just the information, but also the pacing that you're trying to have and, um, you know, keeping a consistent voice and, uh, you know, and, and, and when things happen in a game, you know, like there's plays and last night we missed a double switch. Um, you know, and, and we, we picked it up, but it was, it wasn't until there was a ball hit the right field that you're like, okay, and that's going to be caught by Martinez. Oh, wait a second. That's actually Connor Myers, you know, and I, I and it was, it was, um, uh, Spencer, my partner was on the air, but I mean, I would have done the same thing, you know, like, um, the only difference is that, you know, this is his first game with us. I would have been able to, at this point, look out and say, okay, I would have just said Myers, even though I wouldn't have even known he was out there, you know, in spring training. You did those games. You know what I'm talking about. We had a game against the Red Sox. No, no, no. We had a game against the Padres, the final Cactus League game. They had three different sets of position players. Three. I mean, like, how are you going to get that right, you know? And that sometimes is easier than when you have one guy that makes a change because maybe you're not expecting it, right? Yeah. So you put all these things in a bowl, and let me tell you something. It's easy to make a mistake. All right, talking about the ends and the essence of the broadcast, because I love that thought about all the different things that we are trying to do at once. Base level, here's the pitch, call of the action. Then the level after that, painting the picture. What are we seeing? What does everybody look like? What's the crowd? What's the weather? From there, a little bit more about the players, a little bit more about who are they, where are they, what's going on, the context of the game as a whole. Where are we in the schedule? What's going on in the upcoming games? What's happening in the upcoming homestand? Let's, right. tell, it, let's yeah. tell you what's going on. What's going on in the league? What's going on in the organization? What's going on in the landscape of baseball? What else am I leaving out here? Well, I mean, like last night, let me give you, give you an example. Last night, we, we just updated with the Smokies our entire video feed, right? So it's HD quality. It's the best it's ever been. Now, the audio, they had problems. We had an exhibition game, and they couldn't get our audio. So instead of it coming uh, – well, it, it, it comes out of our headphone amp, which sends it into the video room. And then the audio that we send to the radio station comes out of the board, right? 
So which is it, they're both processed, but then once you put it into that amp and you've got, you know, we got that thing jacked all the way up so that they have a little more volume. And I, I don't know how to fix that. I mean, I, I know my world, but I don't know there. So, I mean, just throw this on top of everything else. We have the game winning hit in the eighth inning. Sounds great on radio, right? But then I hear it on TV. I hear the TV feed and it sounds pingy and loud and not good. And so in my mind, I'm going, okay, now how do I find a balance for me? You know, maybe I give it less juice, but I don't want to take away the enthusiasm and the excitement of the moment. Um, you know, like I'll tell you, Adam Amin, uh, Jason Benetti, the two guys, like I listen to their excited voice calls and I'm just like, I'm just amazed. I mean, how do they, <laughs> you know, how is it so good? You know, and it's yes. like, you're, you're trying to balance the excitement and the amount of, uh, of, of juice that you throw out and the way that you arc your voice, um, you know, and, and it's like, and be consistent. And then, you know, on top of that, for me, you know, being in the minors, you don't have a guy that's, that's sitting, sitting behind you that's good at like, you know, running the sliders up and they know, you know, Tom Hamilton, you wouldn't have heard him last night because he, he's so loud and, and I love him by the way, but he would have blown out at, at, at <laughs> the equipment we have, you know, like the, these are the things that we're dealing with. So you take everything else and then you've got to try to figure out how you're going to like, you know, how much, how much volume that you put out there, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Does that make yes. sense? <laughs> yes, because for me in general, and that's something that I've tried to work on is bring my bass volume up a little bit, but I used to always broadcast play by play pretty calm, pretty well, that meant that I was quieter. And then when I'd get excited, my voice would get louder. And mm -hmm. yes, if I didn't compress it, or if I didn't watch it, I had to do something to make sure that my bass was not too quiet, but my loud was not distorted because it would peak all over the place. And it would not sound good. That clarity of the sound amazes me from those guys who really give it all that they've got. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, like the other thing, and uh, Pat Hughes was the guy who told me this, is you got to be able to pull back off your microphone too. You know, if the microphone's here, you know, and you're going to get loud, you know, kind of go back. I saw a video of Harry Carey um, making a call, like just someone had it online, like, you know, it was Harry's something about Harry the other day. And I, and I was watching like how far, like off the microphone he was, you know, and I, I use a stick mic at home and then I use headsets on the road just because it's easier to, you know, travel that way. But I mean, he like, here's the mic, right. And he's like way back here. And I'm thinking like, ah, that's crazy. You know, like I'm, I'm like, I'm like right on top of that thing. Yes. You know? So maybe that's part of it too, you know, like kind of giving yourself, you know, a little bit of a distance. And then uh, there was a, a, a year or two where I actually put like a windscreen in front of, you know, in, in front of it, not, not the windscreens that, you know, that, that sit on top of the mic that are those furry black things, but this was like, um, you know, like a guard. And it was basically just to keep me as far away from uh, the microphone as I could stay, you know, just, just because I'm loud. I mean, just naturally loud. And I've been wearing headphones, I'm gonna make an excuse, I've been wearing headphones now for like 15 years, uh, half of the day, you know, or half of the days in a year. I mean, like my, my hearing's not great anymore. And, uh, and I think that's a part of it, but, you know, I think naturally too, I mean, you know, uh, like, like a lot of people we call Baltimoreans, uh, we just very loud. I don't know why <laughs> my excuse anyway. As you're from this the D.C. So you're D.C. I don't know how you guys are. I tell you, it's like us Baltimore guys, we're loud. I think this cycles us back around to what Jason Benetti was saying at the very start, which is all the different things that we have to think about over the course of the day. But then also we're our own engineer in terms of sound and equipment in the broadcast booth. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the technical direction, making sure you know who's in left field now, staying on top of every single substitution. Hey, new guy behind the plate, new guy at first base. There's also, boy, I wish I was a quicker tweeter because when we score yeah. runs or when there's a big highlight that happens, hey, the first router just did this. I can't do it while I'm broadcasting or talking. I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. So it's gotta be during that 90 second commercial break. And if it's during that 90 second commercial break, I get it barely in, here we go. And now I'm going, all right, who are the three guys coming up? Who's the pitcher on the mat? 
now I've got to get all reset for this new happening of play by play. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, man. That's it. And, and I've, not, I've never been good at calling the game and then like slamming out a tweet. Like, you know, there's like the in between inning stuff for me is like, you know, I want to talk about the game. You know, I, I love talking about baseball while I'm watching baseball. I had a partner that I worked with once in, in, on TV, and, you know, like, I'd want to talk about the game in between innings, and, and he didn't, you know. And, I mean, I would just kind of want to get – yeah, I know. Like, it was like – I felt like, well, his attitude to me was like, well, I played in the big leagues, you know. Like, and then, but then I'd hear his takes, and I'd be like, yeah, you played in the big leagues, but you're wrong. You know, I mean, in my mind, I'd be like, this is what you just said. Like, but I mean, like, and you're, but you're working with them, so you don't want to be like, okay, well, you know, like, you should know. But it's crazy to me, too, how many guys play, but yet don't really pay attention to the game. You know, like, like when you talk to Kyle Hendricks, what, which is one of the reasons I always loved him, he gets it, man. Like, he just gets it. Like, you, you say, hey, uh, I don't know why – Danny Black is batting 450 against the Smokies because he can't hit a changeup inside at all. Like, and I know that's not a place where you normally throw a changeup, but when you do, he can't hit it. And, you, and, and half of the pitching staff doesn't know that. Now, th this is years ago, you know, maybe before video, or maybe they just can't throw that, or they can't duplicate it. Maybe they, they, they can't set it up. And then you watch Kyle, and it's like, he's got the guy screwing himself into the ground, you know? But, but I mean, like, you sit up there and watch, and you're going, hey, it, at the end of the day, yeah, you can play it because of your athletic ability, but there's a big part of baseball that's right here, and it's amazing to me how many guys don't see that. What you're getting into right there is what frustrates coaches, right? You ask yeah. your coach, the pitching coach, hey, this pitcher, does he understand why he's throwing these pitches Why, where he's throwing them? Does he understand why he's doing what he's doing? Does he understand these? And a lot of guys like to, while they play baseball, turn off their brain, just read, react. And you can tell the coaches and the players who there's something about it. They're not overthinking because that's the other extreme, but they're understanding why they're doing what they're doing. They've put in the preparation and there's a large part of it where they're understanding the game within the game. What does this batter want to do? What does yeah. this pitcher want to do? And they're even thinking ahead. They're going, here's what's going to happen later on this frame, or here's what will happen if the ball is hit to this guy here. That's that game awareness that the coaches are watching for and want more guys to possess. Yeah, I love guys that just know the game. Uh, Trent Jimbroni was with the Smokies last year. Uh, Zach Short, they were the middle infield guys. Just know the game, man. I mean, like, short and short. you know, forget about, yeah, forget about, like, all the rest of it, like, they're just not throwing to the wrong base. Last night, there were some, some moments where the cutoffs were all wrong. And I, I couldn't tell whether it was the outfield throwing to the wrong spot or if maybe the infielders just weren't in the right spot to get the cutoff, you know. All I know is that the, the, it looked terrible. Like the ball's by the mound and there's no one there, right? We just didn't have a lot of that last year. And I think part of it was because the middle infield were, were just so good at not only helping themselves – be in position, but helping other people too, you know, and I'm sure this team will kind of get there. I mean, it's been one game, but you get around certain players that understand the game and it's really easy to see David Bodie's a great example. You saw he signed a five-year contract. He's a utility player. You know, I don't know what his career is going to look like, but one thing that's you can count on with him is that this right here is going to be where it needs to be, whether he's, in the infield or, you know, at third, at second, I could see him, you know, I, I could see him maybe bouncing into the outfield if they needed him to learn how to do that. He just knows the game. You know, his dad was a coach, brother's a coach. He just knows it. And it was, good. yeah, I mean, like th those kind of players, like everything else aside, I love those guys the best. I just do. I just, just knowing the game. Well, it's like what you're talking about during the half innings where you need to talk baseball. You want to process what you're seeing. He's right. doing the same thing in the dugout. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, like this guy, like I'm working with him and I'm like wondering, like that there was a, one of the players for the team that we were calling for, uh, you know, good player, but it was just awful. 
he couldn't get a hit, couldn't get on base, you know, like popping up, like out in front of everything, like taking the fastballs and swinging at the curveballs. It's all messed up. And this guy's, I guess, friends with him, you know, like, and not thinking like as a professional, like, I'm wondering like, hey, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Like, why, why is he taking the two ball pitch? That's a fastball down the middle and then swinging at the two one, which is like a, you know, like a change up or a curve ball away. Like, you know, and, 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 and he's over there on, you know, on talk back trying to figure out like, you know, what's going on after the game, you know, it's like, I don't know. It's it. It's, it's the world that you live in sometimes when you're working with former players and some of them, some of them are great though. You know, like some of those guys come to work every day and, and it's the next career for them, you know? And, and, and I'll tell you, those, those guys are the best because you're like Don Sutton, you know, you, you listen to the Braves and when Sutton's doing color, the stories that he's able to tell the experiences that he's had, you know, like you can tell, like, he takes it seriously. You know, in between innings, he's not worried about who's going to the gym after the game, you know? like. <laughs> and there's a respect that I think we have for the guys who played that take our craft serious, yeah. and it's a two-way street. You know, give us respect, too, and understand that we know this game. Maybe we couldn't play it like you guys, but we sure know it. I think – there, it's a lot about the love of the game, and yes, the intellect, but I also Mick, think it's about curiosity. It's the guys who say, I don't know this, or I've got a question about this, so I'm going to try to seek out the answer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. And that's what they want you to sound like on television. You know, it's like that, you know, it's like, uh, you know, good and damn well what happened. I mean, you've seen, you know, I, they, I, I was interviewed by a TV station here last night, and they said, how many games have you done? And I said, I don't know, probably between two and 3,000. I, I don't really want to know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to go back and count all those games because I said it makes me feel old. You know, I say, well, we, we, game one and game 3,000, look, I, I, I've enjoyed all of them, right? So you do that many games, I mean, you've you got a pretty good idea of what's going on, right? I mean, I don't know how you could. That's funny because I know so many broadcasters who keep specific track of all their games. I am exactly with you where uh, it's, it's at a certain number. Who knows what that number is? I'm fine. I've done games. Right. I, I, I mean, like, I wouldn't even begin to know. I mean, you, you take the games I've done in minor league baseball, spring training, college games, SEC network games. I mean, like, you're talking about a ton of baseball games. And the best part about this game is that you'll see something that you've never seen and you'll learn something. You know, like just when you think you got it all figured out, you see something that you've never seen or you learn something that you didn't know. Um, and I, I try to be open-minded like that. I love being around young, like, guys who really, like uh, when Joe Davis was coming through and, you know, and kind of listening to, like, the way that he saw things and kind of the, the philosophy that he had on broadcasting, you know, and the, the, you know, like the questions that he would ask, you know, you could tell he was going to be, I, I never, never doubted that he would make it and make it big. Um, you know, and it was because I could just tell, like he just, there was something about his drive uh, and, and also the intelligence that, that he had, um, but but it's it, but it kind of recharges your batteries to be around that, and that that's the other thing, you know. Yeah. When you're saying baseball it keeps you young, man, it just keeps you young. Yeah, Mick, we're reaching the end of uh, another week. Glad that we di- yeah. uh, that we did this. And, hey, happy opening day! Yeah, happy opening day. I'm gonna give everyone as I bid you farewell. Hey, look at that! This is the uh, University of Tennessee. That's Shea right there. Just happened to walk by, so you can all see that. And uh, there you go. That's where we did the, uh, the, the show from today. And, I love it. Uh, inside there. Look at that. Inside there, kids doing their thing. So I'll finish doing what, my thing over here, and we'll talk to you next week, Jesse. Beautiful, Mick. This has been the Ballpark Digest Broadcaster Chat. Mick Gillespie, voice of the Tennessee Smokies. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strasser with the Lansing Flag Nuts. At Ballpark Digest on Twitter, ballparkdigest.com. Big thanks to Kevin Reichardt. Big thanks to you 
See you next week.